it's really, really exciting for me to be here. Um, I spent the summer uh, doing a research project on standards. I had been involved in the early kind of bristlemouth discussions with Eric and Evan and Tim and, and the team years ago. Evan and Tim were saying that this started a long time ago. It really did, this discussion. And I was there and it got me interested in this topic of standards because there's these standards are, when you start to look at them, they're everywhere around you. You know, the screws, the, the way that things get to you, everything in our built environment is shaped and touched by standards. And so I had the opportunity to spend the summer researching uh, the long story of standards in a hope to get a better grasp about where this Bristlemouth project fit in that long story. It's interesting, when you bring up standards, a lot of people wanna talk about this um, XKCD comic which is, uh, how many people have seen this? Okay, a handful. But this is, the kind of, this is the kind of general feeling that I got from folks when I started talking about standards. It was kind of an eye roll. Like, oh my gosh, that's so boring. Or yeah, everybody wants to have the competing standard and do all these things. And I think that's really the wrong way to think about this. I think this is a really thrilling canvas for developing and shaping the way that technology goes. Um, so Eric said, we started open ROV in 2000. Well, I'll tell you, we started in 2012. So this was before blue robotics, before a lot of these things. I don't know how many people have been in, uh, oceans for more than a decade. Ocean tech. So about a, a third. Okay. Well, you know, back then I want to take you back to that moment because in 2012 and then 2013, we got invited to this big conference of all these ocean leaders. And it was called Ocean Exploration 2020. And it was Sylvia Earle and, you know, Mbari and Woods Hole and Noah and all these, you know, the leading ocean explorers. What's ocean exploration and conservation going to be like in the year 2020? This felt like a, the far future. And they were like, you know, the discussions were like, well, we're going to need more ships. And there were a few, there were a few of us who were um, there who were saying, I think it's going to be small and cheap and distributed. And we were definitely uh, the minority. I'm going to point this out because I thought this was so funny. I went back and found this photo. Eric, the little weasel, had, had brought, his, uh, brought the original open ROV into the photo. I thought that was so funny. I just saw that recently. Um, but it reminded me of what happened with uh, space exploration, this kind of this journey of the past decade. And I think it gives us a lot of insight about what we should be thinking about, um, you know, in, for Oceans 2030. Like, where do we actually want to take this industry? Um, and this report was from 1994. I, I thought it was fantastic. If you, if you are, have interest in, in space and the way that the technology is involved, I recommend Googling Leo on the cheap and reading this report. It is fantastic. Like it lays out, this was when the space shuttle costs were just going through the roof and it wasn't clear how we were going to get back to low earth orbit for relatively low cost. And he had a, an interesting line. The problem with these boosters is not the technology is decades old, but the problem is that their designs are decades wrong. And I think that was one of the things that we started having these internal discussions with, with so far with Evan and Tim and Eric around um, the connectors like the interface, the interoperability, that's the thing that's holding back cheap platforms and cheap sensors and making, making them work together. Until we get that right, this isn't gonna stick. There's some other fun notes from this, like there's a footnote on there that says, here's the, the, the backyard, lessons from the backyard rocketeers. And it was, people are building liquid filled rockets in the garage and launching them in the Mojave. And it turned out those people that he profiled in this footnote was Tom Mueller. Right? This was the guy who was the first hire at SpaceX. So Elon didn't go to Boeing and pluck people from there. He went out to the desert and got the people who were building the stuff in the garage. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, but he also has this thing about bus standardization off the shelf subsystems. So he knew that um, this was gonna be a really critical component to this. And he, and it, but the interesting line is, well, DARPA has started a research project agency that's been developing standards and bus. So that's done, that's gonna happen. And DARPA did have this F6 program that was you know, put $200 million in developing, trying to develop open interface standards for satellites, didn't stick. But what did stick, ironically enough, was five years later, two professors with no money built this standard, this, this CubeSat standard, they got a beanie box off the shelf and they was like, this is about the right size for a, 
uh, uh, satellite that our students could launch. And it was a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube. And they created this Peapod launcher so they could piggyback on other launches. And they started these, this CubeSat standard. And I, like, this is actually really interesting. I don't know if you can see this, but the dates here, 1998 when they launched, two of their students launching rockets. And for like 10 years, it's like, you know, really just kind of people just picking it up and prototyping with it. And then all of a sudden it takes off. And there's all of these new commercial launches. People finally figured out what they could do with small sats. And one of our, Eric's roommates at the time, um, when we started Open ROV was Planet Labs and they had built a, a, one of these imaging satellites using a CubeSat in their garage. Of course, now this is a publicly traded company. They're running a space program down the street. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's an amazing example of what, when standardization is done right, the commercial opportunities and the, and the research opportunities. There's papers now on all the incredible scientific advancements that have come from CubeSats. So it's a big deal. If you really want to go deep on standards, I recommend this book, Engineering Rules, The History of Global Standard Setting. It's a fantastic resource. It came out a couple of years ago. And it, they view standards as a different realm. It's very different from the logic of commerce or politics. It's this third entity. Um, and we're t standards are like a really broad thing. You could be talking about a lot of different things. You could be talking about emojis, and you could talk about the pasteurization levels and milk in the supermarket. It's just a huge swath of what is... Of like, so when people say standards, not only do they think they're boring, but they refer to everything. So there are a few different ones. I'll just, I'm going to start moving fast, but like safety, the, the initial standards uh, came about because steam engines were just, and, and uh, uh, steamships were blowing up in the Mississippi and all over. They, like, they were just not safe. The term boilerplate actually comes from like this early standards work. Um, interoperability, screw threads. They, they like, it makes sense to have like screws. Can you imagine if every single screw you're using for all these different things was a different uh, thread or a different, didn't have interoperability capabilities? You, you wouldn't imagine it. And then the third one is, or an, another one is performance standards. So when the railroads were getting laid down, all the steel manufacturers were like, we got a better product, but we need to somehow get together and explain to people why this, why this product is better. Right, and so they created these performance st uh, standards around steel, and that's how they won all the the railroad contracts and built this huge business together. Climate change right now is going through this; they're having a real moment of truth because they realized all these carbon credits they had been using. The Vera standard turns out they were worthless um, carbon credits, and so the carbon industry is like really being held back by these missing standards. And and oftentimes that happens. Standards aren't this like this tragedy of the commons. It's actually a, a scenario where the commons fails to materialize in the first place. And there's contractual standards. So like the safe note or the common app for, there's a whole variety of what standards could be. And I think we should start talking about labeling. But now I'm gonna zoom out and talk about the history of how these things actually get made. So the first wave, the first standards entrepreneurs, this is Joseph Whitworth. He came in to the Franklin Club in Philadelphia and he said, folks, and he said, well, boys, he's probably said because it was all men who were involved in standards work at that time. He said, we need these screws to be interoperable. And it was like, just like a group on like this. And everyone's like, yeah, that makes sense. Let's do it. And so it was like a really like a de facto, not a formal thing. That was the, the, early, uh, the early standards work was really kind of these engineering clubs, just finding these greenfield opportunities where cooperation made a ton of sense. That momentum got really hung up and stuck during the world wars. So the world wars, like all these countries retreated into themselves and cooperation kind of stalled out. But after the second world war it really picked up again, and it was buoyed by these big new global industries like air travel and freight, the container is kind of the defining, um, uh, standard of that era and ISO that's when ISO, the international standards, it's the organization of standards international. It ISO is not a, acronym, it's like ISO, and then it stands for something else. So anyways, but these big, you know, multinational, I call it big standard. That's when it really got established from the fifties to like the eighties. And then that system broke down in about the 1990s and it broke down in a particular place, which was computer networking. So the ISO had developed this, this group to develop a networking standard and they were moving incredibly slow. Like it just was, you know, everyone, all these vested interests, everyone thought we need to get 
our, we need our standard work for this computer networking, but it was moving too fast. And the ARPANET team, the small team at DARPA, uh, got it working. They just, they, they got the ARPANET working first within um, the military, and then they released the civilian internet after that. And that was a fundamental change in how standards are made. No longer was it just like the big committees who had say over how these things happen. It was a new kind of disruptive way to do it. Like, let's get it working. And later on, let's go and figure out how to formalize this with standards committees. And that has taken off in a very narrow area, which is open source software. So that's how the web was created. A small team at CERN developed the World Wide Web. And now this is a really common way of operating within open source software. No one thinks about asking for permission. They just go out and write the program and try and find a market or try and find users who will use that software. But this is hit a ceiling. Open source does not work in hardware. There's a real, like there's been open source hardware efforts and we were a part of that with open ROV. It does not scale. Like it's great for hobbyist tools and these things, but it really does not get to the levels of impact that you look at something like the internet or open source software um, has had. And we need to really get back to the fundamentals to think about why. And I love this slide from the IETF, the internet thing. It's like, we reject King's presidents and voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. So let's get something working and let's build up from there. And I think that's, that's like the fundamental idea that we should be thinking about as we try and take that the the core standards um, lessons into the actual built environment. There are some good examples. I talked about CubeSat. It was a really small team that got it working and they worked out from there. MIDI is another example. It was one manufacturer and then two manufacturers and they got their two synthesizers working. And then they went on to define this generation of, of electronic instruments and music. Um, another one that I really like is this, this paper that came out in 20, in 2003 from Tom Knight at MIT. And he proposed this, um, this standard bio brick for um, biology. He's like, we, biology right now is just ad hoc experimentation. We need to figure out how to abstract some of this and get standardization here. And Jason Kelly, the CEO of Ginkgo Bioworks says you can draw a straight line from the ideas in that paper to what Ginkgo has become, what the whole synthetic biology industry has become. This was the first iGEM conference in 20, oh, excuse me, that was not 2019, that was 2004. Um, this was like, it, it, you know, it looks a little bit like this group here, like not so big, everyone's kind of interested in the technology. Um, but uh, this was a video I found from 2019, all the students getting together to race their genetically engineered machines. Um, this has turned into a global movement. They compete with their, their genetically engineered machines, but they also cooperate. It's almost like a coopetition where they're, they're competing by how well their bio brick fits in with the bigger picture. And I think we should aspire to something like this in 10 years or 15 years where the bristle con is not just fitting in this corner office and so far, but we have to rent out the Moscone Center because so many people are interested in marine robotics. It's affecting so many marine industries. I would, that's what I would love to see all the students building with this. I think that's aspirational. Mike and I were talking earlier. What are, so what did I learn studying standards all, all summer? You have to be absolutely focused on the bottleneck. Like all the great standards entrepreneurs, they, laser, they got laser focused on what is the bottleneck that's holding everyone back. And they got a lot of people excited about working on that problem together. And I think, you know, having been in this for 10 years, having been in that ocean's 2020 conference 10 years ago and listen to them talk about the same problems, connectors, this interface, we really got to get this right. And I don't know that the first iteration is going to be perfect, but if we're all working on this together, I think we can get this done. And I think this is a, this is a good group. I know who's here. I know the, the resources that are behind you, and I, but I know the, the energy that you're bringing to this industry. And this is, the, this is the right group to get this movement started. So that's all I've got for you. If you want to read my research paper, it's coming out tomorrow. It's supposed to be on summerofprotocols.com. Who knows if they're actually going to publish it tomorrow, but I have a huge, long research essay if you're interested in all these citations. And believe me, it's really, it's standard stuff. So it's kind of <laughs> not for the faint of heart, but thanks so much. I know you're going to ask where my funding came from for this. Uh.
I'm curious if during your research, you looked into the etymology of the word standard, because I've been kind of fascinated by how, let's say in the late 1800s, you had American standard furniture, you had standard oil later. Standard was this marketing word that people took to mean great. And then as time progressed, people would say, oh, it's fairly standard, you know, like, oh, this is the standard model. Mm -hmm. And it has less flourish and less sparkle. I'm wondering if that you learned about that at all. We had a, we spent at least a day, this cohort of people thinking about protocols. So I wasn't the only one in this research cohort. The entomology of protocol and standard, the difference between standard and protocol, it's a real like hole you can go down. I, so I don't have a simple answer for you, but I'm going to tell you a story that's a little, that's uh, separate than that, that maybe it'll give you something fun to bring to a dinner party. So the word, so the, initially when the telephone was invented by Alexander Graham Bell, um, or I don't forget who invented it, him or Edison, they were racing for the telephone. And all of a sudden it became apparent that when you answer the phone, someone, they needed to know who um, was on the other, they need to know someone was there. So they invent this word that you'd say. And um, Alexander Graham Bell wanted it to be, what do you want it to be? Ahoy. He was like, it's gotta be ahoy. But, uh, uh, but Edison was like, no, it's gotta be hello, which he made up that word. That was where that word came from. So the other thing about, the interesting thing about standards is when you create them, you also get this opportunity to kind of set these kind of subtle cultural tones on top of those standards. And, and I think that that story of, Hello uh, was pretty interesting. We could be typing in our computers, ahoy world, but here we are. <laughs> so not the answer you wanted, but hopefully you like that one better. Thank you. Questions yeah. over here. I see we have two chess club presidents present. <laughs> here we are. Thank you. Um, David, this is super cool. This is something that I feel like I'm thinking about all the time. So I, I want to ask you, you said this one sentence that caught my attention. You said we have to set like good standards, but that's like the most important part minus focusing on the bottleneck. How do you do that? Like, what can you say more about the bottleneck? Can you say more about what it means to set a good standard? I feel like that's too big of a question, but I'm still curious what you think. Um, my, okay, well, I'm glad you asked that because that's what Mike's going to talk about next. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. He, he has some really good ideas about that. Um, I think um, in our, there's, a, there's a guy named Dave Weiner who wrote this manifesto for standards makers um, and rules for standards making is it's what it's called. And, and he's got like a, like a 30 point list and it's bullet points of like what it is. And he had one in there that like stands out above the all above the rest to me, which is interoperability is all that matters. Like you've got to make sure that these things work and they talk to each other. Um, and so I would check out the rules for standards makers. If you're looking for like a guideline, I think it's going to be us up, but that works really well for software, but I think it's going to be up to all of us, like the broader standards enthusiasts to really define what that guidebook is and to develop it for this new like disruptive age of standards because ISO and IEEE and ASM and all the big standards committees they have a like a six point bolt, like here's how you make a good standard yeah. like this is like well worn kind of things but what they don't have is a rule book for stand making standards quickly and you look at like the uh, the Biden's executive order on AI, half of that is we need safety standards. We need standards here. It's mm -hmm. like this and climate change is another one. Like they're missing standards. And so we need technologies moving quickly. We need to be able to develop standards at the speed of the technology that we're developing. And so I think this idea of standard studies or protocol studies is something that's ripe for people to really think about and develop opinions on. So you can read my essay, but don't, like it's meant to be just a starting point. It's meant to be just to get folks like you excited about it to actually come back and tell us what a good standard means. So. This is great. Um, I was wondering if the vision for Bristlemouth was to, to breach the scope of ocean systems and go into other environmental data acquisition systems like controlled environment, agriculture, hydroponics, or weather systems or anything else. 
as far as I know, when we were having these initial conversations, the vision was for the marine industry. You know, we'd all been in these meetings. I mean, we've been to the, I don't know, if you've been in the ocean space, you've been in these ocean conferences and you've seen the same people at the booths talking about what they're doing. And we just can't get over, like we can develop really cheap platforms and we can develop really cheap sensors. We know how to do this. Like going back to this quote, um, sorry. The technology is not decades old. The problem is that the design were decades wrong. We got to get this interface thing right. And that was the discussion we were having because we were trying to solve that internally. And it was like, but can we do something bigger? Is it possible to do something bigger and bring the community together and solve this thing for everyone so we can get to this next, you know, there's this term in biology called fitness landscapes where people get to the top of one hill and they're like, all right, I made it to the top of the hill. But there's this other hill, but in order to get there, you kind of got to go down through the valley. So like, can we get everyone on the same page to go through the valley and, and make sure this interop works and then get to this higher plateau where we have these, these new, this new sensing paradigm, I think it is, really is. It's like lower cost, more distributed, more data, better understanding, higher fidelity. So we were thinking about the marine industry. I think we're still really focused on that. If somebody takes it and runs with it and does that, that would be interesting. But I, I know for me, the focus is really on uh, oceans and marine systems. But I can't speak for that. I mean, it's a big team now. Any other uh, questions? Stumped them. All right, thanks. Appreciate Great. it. Thank you very much, David.